Turning now to another major issue facing young people in America, the COVID-19 pandemic revealed the enormous strain on the mental health care system. And as Christopher Booker reports, parents whose children have complex mental and behavioral health needs have had to take desperate measures to get their kids treatment. It's part of our series, Early Warnings, America's Youth Mental Health Crisis. And a note, this report includes discussions of suicide and depression. Every night, 14 and a half year old Hannah Norris calls her mom Lisa at their home in Hillard, Ohio. Uh, did you eat today? I ate a little bit, yeah. We had spaghetti and meatballs for lunch. That's a good lunch. Hannah has been a patient at a residential psychiatric hospital in central Oklahoma since January. When did you start to notice that she may have had some struggles with her mental health? Almost immediately. After Lisa adopted Hannah out of the foster care system as a toddler, Hannah was diagnosed with PTSD, anxiety, depression, and ADHD. Looks like every other kid in the yearbook. Mm -hmm. Those conditions were manageable, Lisa says, but got worse when puberty hit. The end of fifth grade over the summer was when she fell apart, and we have not had any school pictures since. In recent years, Hannah has made multiple suicide attempts and experienced psychotic breaks. The older she's gotten, the bigger she's gotten, the stronger she's gotten, the harder that is for us to mitigate in the house and to keep everybody safe. So her behaviors became violent? Very much so. The most heartbreaking thing is 20 minutes afterwards, an hour afterwards, once you get her back calm and regulated, like, she's horrified that she did that to people that she loves. Lisa says Hannah is, for now, safe. She can't access really anything to hurt herself. It's staffed 24-7. All the sharps are removed. The goal of inpatient residential programs is to provide intensive treatment so that kids can return home. A 2007 study found the average length of stay varies by program, from less than two months to more than two years. Lisa says Hannah has made progress with daily therapy and new medications. I'm hearing light in her voice for the first time in a long time. But it's been an extraordinarily difficult journey to get the specialized treatment her daughter needs. Like many kids with severe mental health needs, Hannah cycled in and out of emergency rooms and psychiatric units meant to stabilize kids in crisis. Children are children. They are developmentally, physiologically, psychologically very different. Dr. Purva Grover chairs pediatric emergency medicine at Cleveland Clinic. She says more families are showing up in ERs because the supply of specialized mental health services has not kept up with demand. We are not psychiatrists. We are not the specialists of mental health and, and the long-term consequences, treatment diagnoses. We are simply what we call crisis management. Last year, 42 states had a severe shortage of child and adolescent psychiatrists. Nationwide, the number of residential treatment facilities for children fell 30 percent from 2012 to 2020. She definitely overstayed her welcome in an acute facility. They're not designed for long-term care. Celeste Ferguson's 17-year-old daughter Shabo, known as Shabby, has been diagnosed with depression, anxiety, and a mild intellectual disability. She's struggled with self-destructive behavior for years. Um, she would find things to wrap around her neck to get that like sensation and feeling. Um, she would eat things that aren't food items, and this sort of thing was happening any moment. Shabby has been in a holding pattern at a Columbus Children's Hospital for more than 60 days as her mom and care team search for long-term treatment. So we're hopeful that soon um, a bed will open at, there's a couple spots that I think they might be willing to accept her. And hopefully she'll be stable and ready to make that transition. On top of limited services, parents also have to reckon with high costs. We're still paying off the debt from when we couldn't get a diagnosis and we were just private paying everything. Um, the insurance cost, I don't even want to try to estimate other than it's probably in the millions at this point. In 2020, when doctors recommended residential treatment for Hannah, the Medicaid funding she received as an adoptee covered medical care, but not the facility's room and board. They had used up her state funding for treatment, and Lisa, a public school special ed coordinator, couldn't afford the $40,000 she says was required up front. There's no way, and there's no way that most people could do that. Out of options, she says she had to accept an unthinkable alternative, surrender Hannah to the state, which, by law, would be obligated to cover the costs. 
I had to try to sell to her that we're doing this because you have to get help. We're doing this because mom's trying to keep you alive. Kelly Jo Jeffries has seen other parents make this bargain. A licensed social worker, she is the head of Job and Family Services in Portage County, east of Akron. I've not seen in nine years that I've been here um, the frequency that I'm seeing now where those type of tough, tough choices are having to be made from parents. In 2021, 12% of children who came into Ohio State custody entered primarily because of behavioral health needs. Is what you are currently doing uh, what you were set up to do? Absolutely not. We are supposed to investigate child abuse and neglect, not be the ones to try to foster and create placement opportunities. We're not the right professionals to work in that space. Even with funding, she says child protection agencies are struggling to find appropriate treatment for kids in need. We're failing children, and so that's the most heartbreaking part of this um, behavioral health and placement crisis issue. Back in Hillard, Hannah received six months of residential treatment when she was in the custody of Franklin County Child Services. But Lisa says her mental health quickly regressed when she was discharged and placed in foster care and then a group home. My naive thought was by turning her over to the system, they were going to help me put her behind a locked facility where she couldn't get a hold of things to hurt herself. Hopefully help her at the same time. It didn't go that way. With help from an attorney, Lisa regained custody of Hannah but she says was back to square one. With the shortage of mental health care workers coupled with high costs, families often face a series of difficult and complicated decisions when seeking care. In response, states like Ohio have begun to restructure their state services, hoping they can reach more kids and spare families some of the anguish. We know that serving this group well not only results in better lives for the tens of thousands of these children and adults with multiple challenges, but also improves the lives of their families. Last July, Republican Governor Mike DeWine launched a new program known as Ohio Rise. This program is focused on young people with complex developmental and mental health needs, helping them find resources and receive coordination of care that allows them to stay in their home, in the community, and the schools where they live. Good morning. Habiba Rashid Grimes heads Positive Education Program a Cleveland nonprofit that has served inner city youth for decades and now runs Ohio Rise in central Cuyahoga County. Do you guys have school stuff set up yet? If a child's needs can't be met through in-community support like this, oh, okay. the program funds inpatient treatment. Youth under the age of 21 who are eligible for Medicaid and require significant behavioral health treatment qualify for the program. Children whose families earn more than the Medicaid threshold are eligible too through a federal waiver if they have acute needs. What is the reality on the ground from a staffing perspective? We hear again and again that there's, there's not enough therapists, there's not enough infrastructure out there to support these kids. This is true. There is not a big enough workforce to address all of the clinical needs that exist on the continuum of care. And that's going to take time to get folks into that workforce pipeline. It is indeed a, a crisis. For now, Families like Celeste Ferguson's continue to grapple with that shortage. Ohio Rise is working with her county's disability family and children's agencies to cover Shabby's cost once they find long-term treatment. Where does the funding come into the conversation as we sit right now? Do you have to think about that as you're trying to find these facilities? I don't. I was talking with someone the other day and I don't even think twice about it now, which is a godsend. And this financial relief means she hasn't had to consider giving up custody of Shabby. It's also opened us up to a team of people who are incredibly supportive um, that we just didn't have before. The new support has provided tremendous relief for Hannah Norris's family. Last year, a care coordinator helped Lisa apply to more than 100 treatment facilities. When the fully funded spot in Oklahoma opened up, she didn't hesitate to drive Hannah the more than 900 miles. We stopped for fast food. I had the first normal meal with my daughter in months, and then I had to drop her off 14 and a half hours away from home. So I left Oklahoma with her being carted behind the scenes to a place I had never seen, trusting those staff to take her, care of her and keep her safe. And God bless them, they did. Now that Hannah is safe and getting treatment, Lisa can focus on what comes next, finding care closer to home. For the PBS NewsHour, 
I'm Christopher Booker in Hillard, Ohio.